I want you to close your eyes and imagine a country where more than half the candy is tainted with poisonous dyes like lead or arsenic. And yellow candy is even worse. Up to 85% of anything that's a yellow or orange candy, 85% contains lead since lead chromate and lead oxide chromate are often used to give this color. Now, open your eyes because you don't have to imagine this. This is actually the US food supply in the late 1800s. You might remember in part one, I introduced this very stern looking chemist by the name of Dr. Harvey Wiley. Now where we left off, Dr. Wiley is a chemist at Purdue University in Indiana, and he studies everything from sugar to sorghum, but what he's really passionate about is called food purity, or the thought that the entire American food supply should be safe to eat and truthfully labeled. At the time, this was not the norm at all. Really, Wiley doesn't have any traction or any followers of his movement. And to add salt to his wound, he's actually just been passed over for university president at Purdue. Luckily for Wiley, opportunity is about to knock on his door. And in 1882, he gets a job offer to be the chief chemist at the Bureau of Chemistry. And the Bureau of Chemistry later becomes part of the United States Department of Agriculture. So this is a move to the national level. So Dr. Wiley unsurprisingly says, goodbye, Indiana, I'm off to bigger and better things. Once Wiley arrives to Washington, DC, he needs to do a little bit of searching because he's trying to call out actual dangers of the American food supply, but he hasn't gotten the support of any type of government at the state or national level and he doesn't even have any support from the general public, from everyday citizens. So he needs to find a new way to approach this problem. Wiley's new idea is to stop all his preaching about food purity and pleading with people. And instead, he's just going to start to test hundreds of different products from the American food supply and record which contains a poison, how many are mislabeled, how many are dangerous to eat. And after doing this for several years, he publishes a very terrifying and pivotal report called Food and Food Adulterants or Bulletin Number 13, which I'm going to show you today because his results are really crazy. The first section of Bulletin Number 13, this is dairy products, which should come as a 0% surprise if you watched part one because I talked about uh, just how terrible the dairy industry was. If you remember, I talked about swill milk, which is this super low quality milk that in New York City in one year was linked to killing 8,000 children. So the dairy industry is notoriously corrupt at this point. And here is a quote about the dairy industry from a newspaper at the time. For the midnight assassin, we have the rope and gallows. For the robber, the penitentiary. But for those who murder our children by the thousands, we have neither reprobation nor punishment. And I think this is a great illustration of just how terrifying the American food supply was back then. It's really can be, it can be a matter of life and death, particularly if you are old, very young, or already sick. Like eating in the US at that time was a very dangerous activity. Not much has changed about the quality of milk once Wiley gets to the Bureau of Chemistry because once he starts getting samples of milk from all over the place to test, he sees adulteration in a lot of common ways. The first being that the milk is often watered down, but if you water it down too much, then people started adding flour to get back that viscosity and to get back the white color. To add just like a tinge of a darker shade, people often added a couple drops of molasses. And he also saw that there were really, really, really high bacterial counts. This means the milk was not made under sanitary conditions or using hygienic practices. And with these high bacterial counts, it's much more likely to make people sick. 
And even one sample that Wiley got, he wrote that there was live worms in the bottom of the milk. But what's interesting is the tables actually start turning against the dairy industry because by the 1870s, a French chemist realized how we could make margarine or make a butter-like product from lard or tallow or other fats. And what happens is manufacturers realize it's actually much cheaper to make margarine than butter. And they come up with this plan to make the cheaper margarine, but call it butter and they can actually undercut the price of any real butter. Of course, there's nothing inherently dangerous about margarine, it's just a different fat, but manufacturers have to take it too far. And to really fake their margarine as butter to you know, deceive the consumer, they have to find a way to color the margarine, which is sort of like a white hue, not like the yellow of butter. So they have to find a way to add some yellow coloring to it. Now, as Wiley wrote in his bulletin, there are a ton of safe ways to safely, <laughs> safe ways to safely, there are a ton of ways to safely color a fat yellow. You could use things like a natto. A natto is used in cheddar cheese a lot if you see orange cheddar cheese, turmeric, saffron, marigold, etc. But some manufacturers start using coloring agents we really wouldn't consider edible and this is discussed in the poison squad it talks about how uh, margarine might be colored using things like brick dust or red ochre and red ochre i had to google this it's like the red clay in the ground so these these choices aren't you know i wouldn't want to eat it but it is relatively harmless at least because a big problem starts if you look at the last two items on this list the first is chrome yellow. And if you look at the chemical formula, PB, PB is lead. Lead is not safe to eat. You should not eat lead, not even a tiny amount. We think that is still extremely harmful because lead is one of those substances that only leaves your body very, very slowly over months, years, or even decades. And especially in children, lead can have a forever effect of cognitive delays, really horrible side effects of eating lead. So the last item on this list, this dinitrile cresol, I had never really heard of this. I don't think this compound is really used for much anymore. So I had to look it up and uh, what I found was uh, pretty alarming. So this is an extremely toxic compound. It was marketed as the first pesticide, um, but because it is corrosive to human eyes, uh, very irritating to human skin, and can be quickly absorbed through human skin, this is banned in many countries at this point. So I don't think this dinitrile cresol really should be used as a colorant in margarine to make it resemble butter. But what is very unique is all this margarine, butter, fraud, this whole situation does lead to action. And the US Congress passes a law called the Oleomargarine Act, or sometimes just called the Butter Act. And what this says is it stipulates exactly the definition of butter. And it says butter can only be made from milk or cream. So now you have a definition for butter. These margarines made from different sources of fat cannot be labeled butter. And if they are, if they try to fake it, there's a $1,000 fine. And they also established that margarine has an extra two cents tax, although margarine would still be cheaper than butter with this tax anyways. One key thing to remember at this time is if you make a law saying margarine is different than butter, you better have a way to test what is margarine versus what is butter and be able to tell them apart. And at this time, that's also what the Bureau of Chemistry has to do. They have to be able to tell margarine apart from butter. And I want to show you a couple of uh, microscope slides included in this bulletin 13. And so you can see here, butter, lard, all these different margarines, the fat crystals actually take a different shape. So whereas butter is sort of these long, delicate, needle-like crystals, something like lard has more polyhedral shaped crystals and suet is this sort of 
these small rounded masses, you might say they look like sea urchins or hedgehogs. And this is what Wiley saw under the microscope. He saw that margarines are, look quite different than butter under the microscope. We can tell the different fats apart. So we have a way to actually say, well, we can tell this is not butter. Even though you labeled it butter, this is a lie. You are going to be fined. So not only did they have to see, you know, what is safe and healthy to be in food, they have to have a method to test that. And you can see within bulletin number 13, there's actually a lot of drawings of experimental setups of different, you know, chemistry equipment and how exactly the Bureau of Chemistry carried out these tests because they're really paving the way. This is the first time these methods have to be made. I do want to point out the reason this law passed saying uh, margarine has to be truthfully labeled it's really because there was a heavy push from the dairy industry. There was a very strong dairy lobby. It's not like this law was passed to protect consumers or to stop foods from being very dangerous to the everyday citizen. So in one way, it, the Butter Act does sort of fit in with Wiley's beliefs of truthful labeling but it was almost done for the wrong reasons. It was really done for financial profits for butter makers. All right, I think I could probably talk about dairy products for this whole video, but let's move on to the next chapter in bulletin number 13, and this is titled Spices and Condiments. Now in my last video, I talked about how any foods that are ground up and sold, these are super easy to fake. It's easy to partially substitute them with cheaper ingredients. It's easy to not even use the real spice that you say you're selling. And here is how Wiley talks about the spice industry at the time. The amount of adulteration which has been detected is extremely large and of a nature which apparently arouses but little prejudice on the part of the consumer. Because the spice trade has been so corrupt and terrible for so long, a lot of countries around this time are actually starting to regulate spices. So Great Britain, for example, had a lot of spice laws and the spices were inspected for purity. Canada, which at that time was part of the British Empire, they were monitoring the spice trade, so they weren't regulating it, but they were keeping track of it. Unfortunately, the US does not follow suit, so there really is not any nationwide food laws or anyone checking the purity of spices. In bulletin number 13, Wiley does include some of the results Canada saw while they were monitoring their spice trade. And I have to show you this data because it is pretty crazy. So this data is for the year 1878. So if you look at the percent adulterated, the last column for, I don't know, these six or seven spices they tested, I mean, everything is 50% or higher adulterated. Which means if you go and buy a spice, it's over a 50% chance it's not even the spice you think you're buying. Like spices are so adulterated, you are, it, it's more likely than not that you're getting what you want. If that makes sense, it's more likely than not, it's more likely that you're not getting what you want. Let's go back to that table because I want to point one more thing out and that is the mustard. So look at the row of mustard and you'll see there were zero, none, no mustard samples that weren't adulterated. They all were adulterated. There's no actual pure mustard. And they tested 38 samples, which at the time was probably a lot of samples. So this is just crazy. They didn't find any real mustard samples out on the market. But if you think that is bad, let's go back to what the US is doing at the same time, which like I said, there's no national law. A couple states, including Massachusetts, uh, New York, New Jersey, they actually went ahead and passed state law. So a couple states are monitoring the spice trade. And in Bulletin 13, we can get a look at the results from Massachusetts in 1882. And I mean, look at these numbers for percent adulterated. The lowest number is 
The samples are over 60% adulterated. For ground cloves and cassia, there's 100% adulterated. So again, if you are buying spices at this time, very likely you are not getting the spice you intend to purchase, or at the very least, that is actually diluted with a bunch of other stuff to make it much cheaper for the manufacturer to make. I will say probably my favorite part of this chapter is this table where Wiley tries to pinpoint and list each of the adulterants they found in the spices. And it's just crazy stuff like garbage and things you find on the ground. I mean, it's charcoal, it's like burnt seashells, it's different grains. I mean, my favorite comment is under pepper refuse of all sorts like they can't even figure out all this junk that is thrown into the spices it's so it's so much stuff they can't even figure out what is what and i'm guessing this included doing a lot of very tedious microscope work because actually within the bulletin there's a lot of microscopic images included which i thought was very cool but you can see the images of widely comparing a pure black pepper sample with an adulterated one and how they look different. And the same with a sample of cayenne versus an adulterated cayenne. So I know these images aren't super clear, but like this is what this work entailed was just looking at all these different samples and trying to figure out what is actually in these spices. And within this chapter, Wiley also includes a lot of uh, microscope images of starch, of different types of starch, since that's an easy and cheap alternative to sort of dilute these spices. This is actually really cool because starch is such a giveaway. If you can see on all these different types of starches, there's sort of this cross. We call this the Maltese cross, or when starch does this, it's called biofringens. And this is very typical of a starch granule, very characteristic. And really, you only see this in uh, starch. So this would be a dead giveaway that the sample was adulterated. I mean, really, at this point in time, you're better off just not going to buy spices. Like, just walk out into your backyard and grab a handful of dirt, because that is what you're buying in the store. Now, the last chapter published in 1887 is on alcoholic beverages, which honestly surprised me because I knew throughout history, you know, children, men, women, everyone used to drink wine or beer because it was safer than drinking water. But what was happening in the late 1800s and what compelled Wiley to study alcohol is that salicyclic acid started to be used as a preservative in these drinks. Now, when I was first reading this, the first thing salicyclic acid reminded me of was my face wash. I was pretty sure salicyclic acid is an active ingredient in anything for uh, acne, like lotion, face wash. And sure enough, it's in these types of products because it helps with cellular death and turnover. But you might also recognize salicyclic acid if you take aspirin, because once in our body, aspirin is converted to salicyclic acid. And it turns out salicyclic acid has been in use since at least the ancient Egyptian times and throughout history in many other cultures because it can serve as a general pain reliever. And you find uh, small amounts of this acid in a lot of plants and in the bark of the willow tree. So people have been using these plants since ancient times to help people relieve, relieve their pain. There is a catch though. You have to be very careful to not take too much salicyclic acid because if you do, you get salicyclic poisoning, right? You kind of overdose, which can lead to a whole set of symptoms like ringing in your ears, uh, pain, nausea, headaches. You can even get a fever and all these terrible complications. So this is usually, you know, not a huge problem throughout most of history because only minor amounts of salicyclic acid are found in these plants and trees. Unfortunately, things really start to change in the 19th century when two German scientists find a way to synthesize salicyclic acid very pure and in very large amounts. So it's totally different than what people were getting from the plants. 
And this is what leads to the big issue during Wiley's time that all of a sudden there is a huge influx of the salicyclic acid available, the pure salicyclic acid. So for the first time, people are adding it to alcoholic beverages as a preservative. But of course, we don't know if this is safe or not. And you probably guessed, well, maybe it's not safe because that's why I'm talking about it. But I just have to uh, explain to you how exactly this played out. And to prove the safety of this pure salicyclic acid, one of the German scientists, his name is Hermann Kolb, he decides to test the safety on himself. So he starts eating different amounts of salicyclic acid, which I just love when scientists think the best option is to test things on themselves. I can't imagine ever using yourself as a guinea pig or your family. So Herman Kolb, he starts eating different amounts of salicyclic acid and eventually goes like, hey, look at me, I feel great, no side effects. So in Germany, he says, hey guys, it's actually totally safe. Keep doing your thing. Keep putting this in beer and wine. No big deal. I will say that it seems like other countries at the time were very aware of the possibility of salicyclic poisoning, that it was pretty well documented as a side effect. Uh, France, for example, at the same time that Germany said it was fine, France banned uh, salicyclic acid in foods and beverages right away. It was like, no questions asked. This is not allowed. Only a few years later, Germany kind of does a big, oh crap, we don't want to be using salicyclic acid because we don't want these negative health effects for our citizens. So they sort of reverse course. The funny thing is, it's funny is not the right word. The sad thing is Germany produces a lot of beer for the US and German Germany decided, well, don't use salicyclic in the beer for domestic use, the beer that is staying here in Germany, but use it for the beer we're shipping to the US because they haven't, they don't have any regulation. They don't have any laws. It seems they don't care. So actually Germans keep shipping this beer or wine with salicyclic acid to the US because the US hasn't shown any, you know, any moves to regulate their food, their drinks, etc. And in the late 1800s, which is when Wiley starts testing these alcoholic beverages for the presence of salicyclic acid, he finds out that one fourth of all the wine in the US does contain salicyclic acid. And his main concern with this is that people are actually unknowingly medicating themselves, right? If there's enough salicyclic acid in these beverages, people might actually be unknowingly taking a lot of a pain reliever. Because remember, this is now pure salicyclic acid. This is no longer uh, just the salicyclic acid from, you know, the bark of the willow tree or the plants, which is diluted with all these other components of the plant cells or of the bark. This is pure 100% salicyclic acid being used. And you can see some of his results in bulletin 13 here. So he's finding salicyclic acid in wine, syrup, beer, and milk, which two of those things you would for sure give to children, syrup and milk. But what is really terrifying is a therapeutic dose of salicyclic acid is 3.9 grams. And you can see the doses in some of these beverages are honestly getting very close, especially if people were drinking several beers a night or in a day, right? They're basically going to be uh, ingesting a full dose of this medication, of this pain reliever, without ever having a clue. And like I said, in 1887, the first three parts of this bulletin are published. They're out there in the open for normal citizens, for the government, uh, for everyone to read. But nothing really happens. It's not like people, you know, rally behind Wiley being like, wow, you're right. The, the food supply is so dangerous. In fact, a lot of people directly oppose what Wiley is trying to fight for. They don't want food regulation. They don't want any food purity laws. They don't want it to be mandatory to truthfully label your food. And this set of people makes a very long list, including grocery store owners, factory owners, the National Farmers Alliance, National Colored Farmers Alliance, and any Southern states who are really worried about the consolidation of power. You can probably tell at this point, 
Wiley is not getting very far alone. What he needs is to find some powerful allies and that is up next in True Food Crime Part 3. If you are enjoying this series, I have to recommend the book The Poison Squad by Deborah Bloom. I've been reading this while doing research for this series and it's based on the life of Harvey Wiley. I'll put an affiliate link in the description, which means clicking the link and buying the book would actually help support me.